this is Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at Inter Arbor Solutions, and you're listening to Briefings Direct. Our next technology innovation thought leadership discussion focuses on advancements in business applications and the modern advanced infrastructure that supports them and what that combination portends for the future. As we enter 2016, the power of business networks is combining with advanced platforms and mobile synergy to change the very nature of business and commerce. We'll now explore the innovations that companies can expect and how that creates new abilities and instant insights and how companies can turn in turn create new business value and better ways to reach and serve their customers. To learn more about the future of business networks, we're joined by Chris Hayden, Chief Strategy Officer at SAP Ariba. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Dana. Great to talk to you again. Well, you know, to me, <clears throat> for years now, IT architecture is destiny. Um, now that we have cloud, big data, and mobile architectures aligned, more or less, uh, how does that support where you can go with new business applications and processes to get entirely new levels of productivity? Sure. Well, it's, a, it's an exciting new age. It's almost uh, the new platforms, as you say, and the applications coming together is kind of almost creative destructivism. Uh, we, can, we can start all over again. Their value change, value change change because of digitization, we need to respond. So what you see is, you know, you hear these buzzwords like adapt, adaptivity or configurability or whatever, but these are actually real, if you like, table stakes now for business applications and business networks. This digitization of value change is, again, is just forcing us to think about how we bring the notion of uh, multiple uh, constituents within the organization in terms of the adoption and then coupling that with the agility they need to do to deal with um, you know, this constant and increasing rate of change. So this notion of a, a business platform, uh, business networks, people are talking more about digital business. Um, it really means looking at not just new technologies, but how you do business, taking advantage of the ability to have insight into your business, sharing that insight across ecosystems with partners, People have been hearing about this for a while, but do we have any tangible evidence now of how this can be impactful? I guess we could look to some of those uh, B2C success stories, but where do you see the real advantage in action now for a B2B environment? Um, I think what we hear about, the technology is important, but I think what we really hear is it's about the outcomes now, very outcome-based conversations with customers. And so how does the platform with Business Network give you these differential outcomes? And, and what's pretty evident is you have to be closer to your end user. And it's also more and more, certainly the cloud paradigm is about adoption. You're only as good as your last transaction or your last uh, log on on your last order or your last report or whatever business process you're running in. And so, you know, it's, it's this merger of adoption and outcome and how you string these two things together to be able to, uh, you know, deliver again to, these, to, to the customer benefit. So from a technology perspective, you know, it's no longer uh, acceptable just to think about the four walls of your firewall. It really is about that extended value chain. And so this is where we're seeing this merger of this network concept, this business or a commerce network construct, in the context of these business applications, really starting to emerge from B2B. And, you know, it's grown out of the B2C world. Again, the Facebooks or the LinkedIns or the Ubers. Now you're seeing leading practice companies needing to embrace these larger value change or commerce change to give them the outcome and also to help drive differential adoption. So for organizations that are really attracted to this and recognize that they have to compete with upstarts, if they get this right, could be very disruptive to them. When we think about having all your data accessible, um, when we think about processes being automated, um, at some point you're able to gather more data and analysis and process refinement that you then reapply to your business, creating perhaps algorithms and abilities to add intelligence in ways that you couldn't ever do manually. Um, how do we get companies to understand that feedback loop and get it instituted more rigorously in their organization? 
Yeah. I, I think one of the things that we see is is how do we even, with the technology we have today, you know, we can even hide that complexity from from the users and embed it in the way that uh, end users need to work. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about an Ariba example here. If you're going to go and create a new sourcing event, do you really want to have to think about the business you do with your current suppliers? Absolutely. But wouldn't it be great when that's augmented by extra information presented right in front of you? But on top of that, wouldn't it be also great to know that there's three new suppliers in this category, in this geography that you haven't thought about before? And wouldn't it also be great that they could be automatically invited at no extra friction to your process? So, you know, to get more diversity, right, you're actually able to also let, you know, suppliers become, you know, more involved in the process earlier in the process. So we're just, again, redistributing these value chains in terms of linking the the insight and the community actually to the point of where work is being done. And that's part of that, you know, transformation that we're seeing. And that's how we see it in the Ariba context. But we're also seeing that in the larger business network and business application uh, context across SAP. So to borrow the B2C example again, if Uber is our uh, poster child example, mm -hmm. instead of my standing outside of a hotel and having visibility of all the cars that are revolving around that neighborhood, I could be a business and get visibility into all the suppliers that are available to me, and those suppliers will know what my needs are before they even get to the curb, so to speak. Um, what's the next step? That sort of, to me, is, is, as you say, table stakes. But when we gain that visibility, when we have supply chain and uh, buyer and seller synergy, um, what comes next? Is there some way to bring that value and extend it to the end user at some time and point? The next stuff is network resource planning, right? And so this is the awareness, like you say, of what your supply base, but also what other, if you like, stakeholders in that process might mean with us. And this is what it could be for the end user. So it's not just about the supplier. It's about the logistics provider. It's about how you might have working capital and finance. And so what about if you could dynamically match or even uh, have a conversation about differential service levels from a buyer or supplier, I'm okay to take it tomorrow if I can get it at 8 a.m. but it's at $2 cheaper or I'm, I'm happy to take it today because of some other dependencies. This is the type of what if, dynamic what if, because we have you know, the, the technology platform capability, um, you know, in time, real time memory, um, analytics, but in the context of the business process, this is this kind of this next generation that we'll be able to get to because the network is external to the to the application, but together understanding the players in the network of the actors and in the context of the business process, mm -hmm. that's where that real next next evolution is going to come. And it sounds as if we are really starting to remove the margin of error from business. We're starting to remove excess capacity fit for purpose through that dynamic applicability of insight and analysis. Um, how much can we squeeze out? Do we have a sense of, um, you know, a rounding error here? Is this something much more substantial? When we think about attracting enterprises to adopt these uh, capabilities, these business network capabilities, what sort of payoff are we, are we anticipating when we can remove that margin of error, fewer mistakes, tighter integration across in, uh, ecosystems? What's, what's the, uh, the, the gold piece that we're, that we're going after here? Well, it, it, it's, a, it's a big, big, big number. I, you know, I think even if we go back a couple of years and, and there's some good work been done on just the inefficiencies and the first order of magnitude on paper, right? And that's just moving something from a paper format and dematerializing that into an electronic format. You know, that was conservatively, um, you know, four years or five years ago, I think A.T. Carney did a study on that. Don't quote me, somewhere between 600 billion and a trillion dollars just in the global 2000, you know. You know, we're talking about, I think there's an order of magnitude of that, of opportunities globally from just this, this compression of um, cycle times in the, in the broader sense um, and responsiveness and of adaptability uh, throughout the whole, throughout the whole um, you know, world globally. 
And and I just look if I take that back and look at that microcosm of Ariba right now, um, and if you want to multiply that through, uh, you know, we passed the great threshold in, in 2015. We 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 ran more than a trillion dollars worth of commerce across our business network. And you just start doing a little bit of maths of, uh, around what a one or two percent improvement of that spend can be from better working capital management, right, or more flexible working capital management, just pure straight productivity, and just competition, leveling the playing field for the smallest micro supplier through to the largest international supplier and just leveling that out. Um, you know, the stupendous games on both, you know, both sides of the balance sheet. What's intriguing to me too, Chris, is because this is cloud-based, because organizations that may have been conservative and held back, perhaps uh, risk averse, um, don't necessarily have to pay a penalty because they can adopt this very rapidly given the fact that it is cloud-based, is there a leapfrog capability here? And, and what sorts of organizations um, are you seeing making a bold move, not just piecemeal, not just a baby step, but actually saying, we're going to really buy into this? And can they really bite off a lot and, and get a lot done with you know, a relatively short amount of time? Yes, and yes, uh, uh, across the board, and it's and it's funny. You see it in uh, at least we see it in in industries where are traditionally conservative, but they really do need again to change their value change because that's what's going with their with for their, what their customers are demanding. And so whether you know it's financial services, right? Where historically you would think you know the old big iron approach, you know the those type of companies embracing what they need to do on cloud uh, to just to to be more adaptive, to be faster, and also to be, I guess, somewhat more you know end user and total end user friendly and total cost of ownership um, you know approach from the cloud is really there. But I will say as well, though, you know, I think we're a long way away from on premise being dead. I think what the cloud gives enterprises is. They can go largely or 100% to the cloud, and we and we see companies doing that. But you know, legacy hybrid on-premise is is really important, and and that's the great also thing about that cloud model. You can consume as you go, so it doesn't all have to be big bang. And I think again for pragmatic CEOs, pragmatic CFOs, pragmatic CIOs, that blend of hybrid is is a legitimate strategy. Um, uh, and where they can have a little bit of the best of both worlds. That said, the inextricable pull to cloud is there, but it can be a little bit more on their own terms that make sense for their business. Let's, uh, we've been at the uh, 70 to 80,000 foot height on this discussion. Let's bring it down a little bit lower. Help our readers understand SAP Ariba as an entity now, what it consists of in terms of the SaaS um, services that have been acquired and built, and uh, how that then fits into a hybrid portfolio? What might you want to necessarily start with as a SaaS cloud service set? And what might make more sense? And it will depend, of course, on your individual company and vertical industry. But how, how, do, you, how do we tease out and rationalize your portfolio of companies and what perhaps a hybrid um, uh, shakeout or, or, or equation might be? Sure, sure. Um, you know, number one is we fundamentally believe in Ariba and that to give differential outcomes to our customers that linking cloud applications with the business network construct will give you better outcomes for the, the things we spoke about earlier in the conversation, visibility, supply chain, adaptability, uh, you know, compliance, building on networks of networks to be able to deliver different outcomes, linking to payment networks like we've done to Discover, linking to content networks like we've done with eBay, but bringing them into the context of the business process can only really be enabled through networks and applications. So from an Ariba perspective, we like to think of it in, 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 in three pillars for everyone. Um, and simply, we talk about our cloud applications. And we have leading, leading practice, widely, broadly adopted source to pay cloud applications and a fully integrated suite. Now, of course, from a cloud perspective as well, you can have the Lego block approach where you can take any one of our modules from spend visibility all the way through to invoicing and start your journey there if that's your line of business requirement or take the full suite approach. Intrinsic to that offering, of course, is our business network. And why I bring that up is our business network and our cloud applications are agnostic. So 
we don't actually care from a cloud perspective on which back-end system of record you wish to use. Now, of course, we love and we believe that the best out there is S4 HANA from an SAP perspective, but there is also a larger market, whether it's the mid-market, whether it's other customers who are on other journeys on ERP for legacy, legacy reasons. We can connect our cloud applications and our network to any one of those. So three levels, again, network, our end-to-end -end cloud applications, and last but not least, which is really relevant from the technology journey, is a rock-solid platform. And so moving towards our platform that runs our cloud apps and our network in conjunction with SAP for the security, for the privacy, for the availability, for all of these really important things that enterprise customers need and, and have to have the security, if you're right, or the mm -hmm. confidence, I should say, mm -hmm. in, in running their business processes because they're entrusting them to us. And that's really what cloud means. You're entrusting your business processes to us to get a differential outcome for your business. And as organizations try to become more of a digital business, they'll be looking to bring these benefits to their ERP level business applications, their supply chain and procurement. Um, but increasingly, they're also looking to manage better their human resources mm -hmm. and recognizing that that's a dynamic marketplace more than ever. Yes. So let's talk just for a brief bit about how the business network effect mm -hmm. and some of these synergistic benefits come to play in that human resources side of running a digital business. Yeah, no, great question. And I think that's that's also one of part of the great uh, parts from a, from an SAP portfolio. So when when you think about it, I, I like to think about it in two ways, you know, there's human capital management there's human capital management internal and there's human capital management external. And again, leading practice companies today want to be out of balance and have agility on how many FTE should I hire as full-time employees and what do I need to have for my contingent or temporary labor aspect. So from an SAP perspective, what's great, we've got the leading cloud, uh, human resource management, talent management, uh, solution and success factors. And we've also got the, the, the market leading vendor, vendor management, contingent and statement of work, labor solution, field glass, right? Together with Ariba, you're actually able to one, have a one visibility view on your workforce in and out. And also, if you like, orchestrate that procurement process and, the, and to, to get sourcing, ordering, requisitioning and, and payment throughout, throughout that piece. So again, from a, from a company perspective, when you think about your spend profile, you know, more and more companies, 30 to 70 percent of the spend is about services as we move to a service based economy. And in the conjunction with SAP Ariba and SAP Fieldglass, we have this, you know, broader, deepest end to end process, you know, in a single context, by the way, integrated nicely to the ERP system to really, again, give those outcomes. Um, when people think about public clouds that are available to them for business, they often couple that with platform as a service or pass. And one of the things that other clouds are very um, competitive about is uh, portraying themselves as having a very good developer environment. Mm -hmm. But increasingly, development means mobile apps. Yes. You could say you're cloud first, you could say you're mobile first, I'd say you're mobile and cloud first. What do we then bring from your cloud vision um, being hybrid, but also taking advantage as much as possible of, of the development to operations uh, synergy or DevOps. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how this cloud vision attracts organizations that need to get mobile and want to have custom apps to do it. Yeah. So I think I, I like the way you did it, and maybe the way to do it from even from a platform perspective is, is maybe you need to be API first. Because if you're actually able to expose, if you like, the ends of a business process or some specific, if you like, uh, important aspects within a business process um, via an API layer, right, then of course you give that extensibility and that optionality to your customers to do things. So, you know, let's talk about concrete examples here, right? So an end-to-end -end process could be as simply as you know, you could take a invoice, if you like, from any third party provider. So if right now Ariba has an open invoice format, so 
if someone chooses to scan it themselves and digitize it themselves or there was a, you know, something that a customer wanted to do, we could take that straight feed in. If you want to talk about a, a mobile API, it could be as simple as you want to expose a workflow. There's a larger corporate mandate sometimes to have a workflow for your travel, a workflow for your expenses, a workflow for your leave requests, and a workflow for your purchase orders, right? Do you want the customer, the end user to go to five systems or would you rather come to one? So you can have that API level there. What I can say is really that th th there is this whole balance of how do you, if you like, uh, molecularize your off offerings, right, to enable customers to to have that level of configuration that they need for their individual business requirements, but quite honestly, still get the leverage of not having to rebuild it all themselves. And that's certainly a fundamental part of our strategy that you'll see um, that SAP is leading um, in itself uh, under, under our uh, HANA Cloud platform. And, and certainly SAP of Reba is, is building on that. And you'll see, I don't want to flag too much, but you will see some interesting developments along that way as, as we open up our platform from both an end-to-end -end perspective and also from an individual uh, mobile perspective um, throughout the course of this year. Now, this concept of API first <clears throat> is very interesting because it then doesn't really matter which cloud it's coming from, be it on a hybrid spectrum of some sort. Um, it also allows you to look at business services and pull them down as uh, needed and construct processes rather than monolithic, you know, complex hairball applications. Do you have any examples of organizations that have taken advantage of this API first approach and how have they been able to customize their business processes using this hybrid cloud invisibility, reducing the complexity, maybe just some tangible uh, examples of uh, exploiting the API first concept? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, I can't give you, a, because I, I can't give you the top of my head the actual company names, but I can certainly give you some examples. You know, I, I think when you think about, uh, let's just start when it sounds like simple processes, but they can actually add a lot of value. Uh, for example, um, you have a, a straightforward uh, shipping process, an advanced shipping process. You know, we, we know of an example where a customer has taken 90% of their time uh, out of a receiving and, and, and made the matching of the receding process almost 95% um, because they eliminate the, the data entry because they're actually able to leverage an API to support their custom barcoding standard, right? So they leverage the standard business network bus, but because that type of barcode that they need to have in their warehouse and their part of the world was there. now. You know, if we had have done that, let's wind the clock back three or four years. If we had have asked for that specific feature, to be very candid, it wouldn't make it, right? But once you start opening up the platform at that micro level, right, you can actually let customers get the get the job done, but still leverage that 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 larger um, framework, that platform, that business process, the cloud that we give them. So that's you know, one simple example, but when you extend that out for what it could mean, again, for payment or for for risk or for any of these other dimensions that are just typically orthogonal processes to the current, whether it's procurement or whether it's um, HR recruiting or whatever it's like, it gets pretty exciting. One of the other hallmarks of a digital business is having aspects of a business work in new ways together in closeness that they may not have in the past. And one of the things that's been instrumental to business applications over the past decades is this notion of a, a system of record or systems of records. And also we've had this burgeoning business intelligence now loosely called big data capability. And they haven't always been that close. But it seems to me that with a platform like HANA, with business networks, that systems of record and the data and information in them and the big data capabilities, as well as accessing other data sets outside the organization, make a tremendous amount of sense. How do you see the notion of data, regardless of its origin repository, becoming a common value stream to an organization? Um, how I see it, I, I, I think it becomes the 
almost the fundamental competency that an organization needs to harness, right? This, this notion of the data and then the data in the context of the business process. And then again, to your point, how that's augmented in the right way um, is, is really the true differentiation, I think, for where, for where it will go, right? So historically, if you think we laid down the old railway tracks on the business process, there's no such thing as uh, railway tracks anymore. You, you will rebuild them every single day. And that, that data, one, the timeliness of it, and, 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 and two, if you like, that larger sentiment analysis that you can get in, uh, from, from a business network <coughs> context, this enables you to make uh, different decisions. So I know certainly within SAP Ariba, we're fundamentally you know, rethinking about how can we have this, the data that's actually in our environment and how do we get, them, get that out, not just to our account managers, not just to our product managers, but just as importantly out to our end users to actually just start to see patterns and play with it. And, uh, and it's some interesting, you know, interesting co-innovations that we are working with uh, customers specifically, really in some some more traditional areas, but some new areas too around um, you know forced labour in the supply chain or, or, or global risk management, or even um, you know expedited delivery and logistics. Okay, we've talked about business networks in the context of applications working together for efficiency. We've talked about the role of uh, hybrid cloud models uh, helping to accelerate that. We've talked about the data issues and some of the development and customization and mobile side of things. What have we missed? What is the, the whole uh, greater than the sum of the parts component that well, we're not talking about that we should? Well, I think there's, there's probably two or three. Um, there's certainly the notion of the user experience, um, and that's a function of mobile, but not mobile only. Um, you know, the notion of again, reinventing the flows, the, the old maybe traditional flows and, and, and thinking that was prevalent even five years ago on what constituted one type of work channel, if you like, right? That, that no longer exists. And so that the, the new discipline of what a user experience is about, and that's not just you, um, the user interface. That's also things like the, just the tone or the content that's presented to you. Um, it's also what it does mean on the differential devices and where you're working. So I think that's, that's an evolving piece but cannot be left behind. That's where the B2C world is blazing and that's now the expectation of all of us in our, in our, when we go to work and put our corporate hat on. So there's that. I think the, there's two other pieces, um, certainly just security. And, and, and privacy. I mean, that is top of mind for a number of reasons. And it's really fair to say that it's in a massive state of flux and change, you know, here in the United States, but certainly in Europe and, in, and certainly in, you know, I, it doesn't matter which region you're in, APJ or, or Latin America as well. So that's, that's a really, um, I think, another almost competitive advantage, right, that, 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 that enterprises and, and providers in the space like SAP and SAP Ariba will, can and will and should lead on, right? Um, I think the last point to large, maybe mega thing, a, a, a trend is you are really seeing very quickly, I believe, the, the transition between the traditional service and material flows that, that exist and then the financial flows. So we're seeing, you know, the digitization of payments just kind of exploding and banks having to re and financial institutions having to rethink and, and, and look at what they're all doing. But with the technology and the platforms we have, that linking of actually those uh, physical flows, right, whether they be for services or whether they be for materials and that crossing over to that payment and then the natural working capital and because at the end of the day, a lot of this fo commerce follows money, right? It's all about the commerce. And so, you know, that I think that whole space and that whole area and that technology is 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 a is a trend as well. So security, UX, and the whole payment, working capital management, or the digitization of that are the three three large things. And these are areas where scale really 
helps uh, global scale like a company like as SAP has when issues of data sovereignty come up and you need to think about hybrid cloud not just in its performance and technical capabilities but the actual location of data, certain data for certain periods of time in certain markets. Uh, very difficult to do if you're not in those markets and understanding those markets. And the same with the financial side because the banking and the finance uh, is dynamic, is, is different, uh, having that breadth and scope uh, a key component of making that possible as well. All right, <clears throat> one last area we can uh, close out on, and that's looking a bit to the future. Uh, some competitors of yours are out there talking about artificial intelligence more than others. Mm -hmm. And when you do have network effects, as we've described, big data um, and a mesh across your organization, thinking of data as a life cycle for a digital business, not just data uh, in different parts of your organization. Um, we can think about expertise in vertical industries being brought to bear, insights into markets and ecosystems. When and how might we expect some sort of an artificial intelligence value API, if you will, or set of APIs to come forward to, to start um, thinking things uh, through in ways people probably haven't been able to do up until now or in the near future? Yeah, I, I, I think the full notion of like uh, a HAL 9000 uh, is, is probably a little way away. I, but then again, I think what you would see, um, certainly within the next 12 to 18 months, is specific, maybe you call them smart apps rather than intelligent or smart agents. Uh, they, they kind of already exist today in some areas. What you'll do is you'll see them augmented because of feedback from a system that's not your own right which is hey i've seen you know, like whether it's a moving average price of an inventory right so someone will bring the context of um you know an updated price or an updated inventory and that'll trigger something and that'll be the smart agent to go and do all that work for you but ready for you to make the release because i think there's still a a, a notion of a competency as well within a um within the organization not as much even a technology thing as, it, as I mean, but a competency on what master data governance means and the quality of that data means and being able to, you know, have a methodology to be able to manage that to let these systems release to do it. So you'll see it probably in the lower risk spend categories, at least from a procurement perspective, indirect or maybe some travel and, and these aspects, maybe a little bit of non-inventoried uh, materials repair and operating supplies, you're probably a fair way away from fully releasing supply chain, direct material supply chain, and some of these pretty pretty important value chains we manage. So maybe we should expect to see self-driving business processes before we see self-driving cars? Uh, I don't know. I see I'm lucky enough to live in Palo Alto here. I see a self-driving car three days a week. So, um, no, I think, I'll, I think we'll back out of that one. Um, you know, but what I will say all, as well, um, there's a really important piece that, from an, at least from a REBA perspective and an SAP perspective, we really fundamentally believe that these business networks are the rivers of data. So it's not just what's inside the four walls, your firewall, you will truly get the insight from the largest scale of these rivers of data from these business networks whether it be Arebas, whether it be Concurs, whether it be our financial partners, or whether it be others, there will be networks of networks. And this notion of having a, uh, you know, kind of the bookend of the process, right? A registry to make sense of the actors in, this, in these business networks in the context of the business process, and then linking that to the financial and payment mm -hmm. chains, that's where the real intelligence and some real money could be released. And that's some of the some of the thinking that we have out there. So uh, a very bright, interesting future. But in order to get to that uh, next level of value, you need to start doing those uh, blocking and tackling elements around the uh, rivers of information, as you say, the network effects, and putting yourself in a position to then be able to really exploit these new capabilities when they come out. Correct. Yeah. It's scale and adoption. From the scale and from the adoption will come, you know, that 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 true tertiary right benefit from the networks and and the business process and the connectivity therein. Well, great. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. You've been listening to a briefing's direct thought leadership podcast discussion on how advancements in business applications and the modern advanced infrastructure that supports them pretends 
new and higher degrees of business innovation. And we've heard how the power of business networks is combining with these advanced platforms, mobile synergy, and data analysis to change the very nature of business and commerce. So please join me now in thanking our guest. We've been joined by Chris Hayden, the Chief Strategy Officer at SAP Ariba. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks, Dana. And a big thank you, too, to our audience for joining this SAP Ariba Sponsored Business Innovation Thought Leadership Discussion. I'm Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at InterArbor Solutions, your host and moderator. Thanks again for listening, and do come back next time.